welcome you to the Carquinas Village Monthly Speaker Series. Normally this takes place at our local library and would be in person, but of course with COVID, we have been doing this on Zoom. Um, just to fill you in a little bit, Carquinas Village was founded by older adults for older adults so that we can connect and inspire one another as we age. We are a virtual organization offering support services to assist our members in times of need and a calendar of stimulating activities to engage our members' minds. So with no further ado then, I would like to introduce you to our speakers for today. Of course, we are going to hear today about how to use an auction house and how to schedule an estate sale. So first we're going to hear from uh, Allison Bradley of Michonne's Auction House. Allison went to George Washington University and, and attained a degree in art history. She then worked for the Artisan uh, Illinois Group in Chicago, later on for Butterfield and Butterfield, and right now is serving as a vice president at Michonne's Auction House. She's now gonna uh, share her hints on how to consign items with them. And Michonne's, as you know, is a leading full service auction house on the West Coast that specializes in appraisals and sale of antiques and fine arts. There's sort of a mystique about auction houses. And so I wanted to walk you through what we do and the services that we can offer, um, that we offer all the time. And um, so we, our first um, thought, my first thought to all of you is knowledge is power. Um, a lot of people don't know what they have. And we offer complimentary walkthroughs, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Uh, an appraiser will come to your home if you have 20 or more items and they will give you a verbal auction estimate for what they think things will sell for. At that point, if you're happy with those estimates, then we can talk about the consignment process. If you have less than 20 items or you're concerned about the COVID situation and you don't, wouldn't like a stranger in your home, we, can, we have a, an upload on our website so you can send in photographs and we can send you auction estimates uh, via the internet with your images. We also hopefully will start free appraisal events within the next month or two. Um, once the vaccine starts getting um, distributed and people are more comfortable and the restrictions are lifted again, uh, we have free appraisal events every Wednesday from 10 until one. So you'll just check back on our website and we will let you know when those begin again. Um, the, the idea behind knowledge is power is this soapstone that you see on the screen. A woman bought it at a silent auction. It was her son's school auction and nobody had bid on it at the end of the night. So she wrote down $100 and took it home. It was in her closet until she passed. Her kids brought it in to us and said, we don't know what it is. And so they consigned it and it took us about three to four months to figure out what exactly it was. And it ends up that it's essentially a carved soapstone, but it was a birthday card. Um, sorry, I'm trying to hang up my phone. Um, and so, And it was that he's the, the master fire of a village that made that fired porcelain. And we offered it at auction for a hundred to 200,000 because there were no auction records of this type at all. And it sold for 2.2 million. So that's what I, and more times than not, we will go to visit a home and the people will have put out things out on their dining room table that they think are their valuables. And we take a look at them and we don't find anything that's all that uh, of auction worthy. But then we'll say, oh, I see the bags going to the Goodwill. Um, would you mind if we look through those? And 
we find an Indian basket worth six thousand dollars, or we find things that that are that are much more desirable at auction that that people don't know about. So that's the idea behind these walkthroughs and the photo appraisals is just giving you an idea of what you have. And whether you want to sell it or not, at least you know what it is. And um, before you pass it on to a different generation or whatever you decide to do with it, it's nice to know what it is. We also conduct appraisals, formal appraisals. So if you're looking, if you need a date of death appraisal for estate purposes, or if you want an equitable distribution appraisal for your family, that we can conduct that. And we also conduct insurance appraisals if you think that you have something that is of high value that you want to insure. Um, we will tell you before we charge you <laughs> that probably you don't need an insurance appraisal for something or we will say you definitely need an insurance appraisal for this. So that's, that's one of those uh, things that, that you can take into account. One of the things that some people don't understand or don't know, and if you had an insurance appraisal done for some of your pieces way back in the 60s or 70s, um, there are trends and prices that change. And the, the easiest one to understand is gold and silver prices. In, in 1965, gold was under $50 an ounce. And now it's at 19, it's at 1800. Um, and we all know that it has gone a little bit higher, but now it's at $1,800. So your insurance appraisal back then needs to be updated if you, uh, everything, the prices have gone up. Um, another thing that you should know about insurance appraisals is that is those estimates are probably three to five times more higher than what a fair market value is. So a lot of people are surprised when they come in and they say, I want to sell this ring for $15,000 and we'll say, we'll offer it for five to seven. Um, it's because there's the difference of a replacement cost as opposed to offering it in a secondary market. So that's an important thing to understand. Um, also, we do business with a lot of different countries and the um, foreign currency versus a US dollar, the value also is something that, that when the, the, the values are higher or lower, we'll get a lot of influx of Chinese buyers, Japanese buyers, um, because their dollar is, is, is higher or lower than ours. So the, that's something that we take into account when we're setting estimates and we look at who our buyers would be for certain things. There are also social trends where um, we, we have brown furniture and brown furniture doesn't necessarily sell anymore. Um, but if you put mid-century modern in front of it, it will sell very well. Um, and so that, that's one of those things. Um, this Bonnetier, which is beautiful 18th century, um, it sells for maybe $400 now. Um, the the um, Ames chair, it sells right now for about uh, $6,000. So you, you see the difference in the trends. We actually are seeing brown furniture come back a little bit. I didn't think that I would ever say that, but um, we are having some sideboards and, and even armoires sell for a, a decent amount of money. It's not back where it used to be in the 80s and 90s, but um, brown furniture is sort of making a comeback. The other thing, one of the other things that you want to think about is the socially conscious trends that we've gone through in the past 10 years that you've heard about. Um, ivory, uh, we have gone to the point where we cannot sell ivory. The, the, the limit is that it's the size of a cue ball and it has to be in an old piece of, of say a teapot or a musical instrument. Um, but any carved net skis or any ivory at all, we cannot sell. 
Um, so unfortunately, the value of, of ivory has gone to zero. Um, and like this um, rhinoceros wine cup, it, we sold it um, for $70,000. And then in two years, the fish and game have changed the, the um, regulations. And so now it's worth nothing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something to think about. And there are uh, what the IRS will tax you on things and the sell value of, of things is something that you think about for your estate uh, tax purposes. And um, this is one of the, the interesting stories of, of the time that, that most of us will not have one of these, but it's a great story. This is a 3D uh, painting and sculpture by Robert Rauschenberg. And um, it was valued at $65 million. And the IRS wanted to charge the estate for the value of $65 million. But what is in this sculpture is a bald eagle and it is illegal to sell. So essentially they went back and told the IRS that the value is zero. And they spent many years in court and finally they ended up donating this, in, this sculpture to the museum, to a modern museum of art in New York and the IRS wouldn't let them take any charitable tax deduction for it. So um, it's, it's an interesting play on what the IRS looks at in estate tax. Anything that's above $5,000, they're going to uh, test and look at. It's important to make sure that you have comp uh, comparables for things, if, if you're doing a, a, a donation, if you're giving something as a donation, they're going to want to see three comparables for the same amount of money that you're trying to donate the piece for. When you consign property at an auction house, there's a master consigner agreement and that, that is a, a general contract and it has seller's commissions which ours are on a sliding scale. And so if a piece, which is a lot sells. So if you consign a household of things, you're going to have 120 lots. It's gonna be, uh, and it can be a couch as a lot or it could be an entire set of silver as a lot. And those, so uh, the, the seller's commission is based on a per lot basis. And uh, it is one to two hundred dollars is thirty five percent. Two hundred one to one hundred dollars is twenty or a thousand dollars is twenty five percent. A thousand and one to thirty five hundred dollars is twenty percent. Thirty five hundred one to seven thousand dollars is fifteen percent. And then anything above seven thousand dollars is ten percent. There is also an insurance charge. And that's standard across the board. Um, our insurance charge is 1.5% of the hammer price. We do not charge insurance if an item does not sell. Um, that's important. And that's something if whether you are interested in gauging another auction house or our auction house, it's important to ask the questions about the insurance and if you have to pay it if an item doesn't sell and what their photography fees are. We uh, do not charge photography fees. Uh, certain uh, more auction houses than not do. They'll charge you a fee to, put the, to photograph it and put it in their catalog. And then there's something called a buy-in fee, which um, if you consign items and there's a piece that doesn't sell, you're gonna get a letter saying, we'd like to lower the estimate. And if you decide that it's worth more than that and you'd rather have it back, then you, um, we say, come pick it up and you can take it. Other auction houses are gonna tell you that you need to pay 5% of the low estimate to get the piece back. So those are just important things for, for you all to know and questions to ask before you sign a consignment agreement with anybody. Uh, Along with the consignment agreement, 
you'll, you can get a schedule A, which is itemizing of the property and with estimates of it. So before you can sign it, you'll be able to see what the estimates are that we are saying that we'll offer it for auction and both the consigner and the auction house will sign the schedule A. Once the property comes in, it's vetted and it will go to either, we have fine sales twice a year and we have gallery auctions every month and we have annex auctions every month. And so the, the, every piece is photographed and it's put up online. We have an online auction platform um, through our website. So you can bid through there and photographs are taken for the fine and gallery sales that are detailed. So you'll have five to 10 images on those um, images. The annex lots are just one quick image because we sell about 2,500 to 3,000 lots a month in our annex sales. Those are everyday items. They're the drinking glasses and um, you, you, the office supplies, things like that. We can go in and we'll take We'll leave the house broom swept and sell everything. Um, we cannot sell mattresses, so uh, we will be more than happy to dispose of them, but there is a disposal fee for those. Um, but that's sort of the, the breakdown of our auctions. And then, so when the property comes in, it's broken down into departments and we have specialists in all kinds of departments. We have an, a fine art, we have two fine art appraisers, an Asian art appraiser, stamps and coins, a gemologist, and furniture and decorative arts. And um, we have an ethnographic appraiser. We have all kinds of people that have lots of education and lots of knowledge that they can drill down and will give us good descriptions. And um, we sell to, we've sold to over 47, 000, 47 countries. Um, through our online platforms. So we, we get great exposure. The internet has really flattened the, the uh, playing field for auction houses. Um, the big auction houses have houses everywhere in the world. And then you have the little mom and pop auction houses. But now the mom and pop auction houses compete with the big guys because we have an online presence just like they do. This is an image that I, uh, what I'm showing you is a, um, what we do for the gallery sales and the fine sales. We take an overall image of, of the piece and then we take an up close if it's sig with a signature and then any um, condition issues and then the back. The marketing efforts we have, we are online. We have our own online auction platform, as I was saying, and we also sell on live auctioneers. And we have um, our own marketing material that we have consigning brochures and up items that are upcoming. And um, then we have previews. Uh, we schedule appointments at this point. It used to just be open whenever, but you can call and set up appointments to preview uh, the, and see the items physically. Uh, we also have online catalogs and appraisers are on hand for any questions. Um, this is a view of our main gallery. We are based out of Alameda. We're on the old Naval Air Base. And so we have about 100,000 square feet of property. Uh, this is the old bowling alley that we've converted into our main gallery. And um, then we have an annex where our annex sales are, which is the old, one of the old heli helicopter hangers. And these are some of the things uh, we sell old tools. Um, we, everything that comes through, we sell it. And um, you would be surprised that there are lots of people looking for all kinds of things. Um, and that goes back to, again, letting us take a look to see what you have. Um, the types of bidding that we offer, uh, you can bid, uh, you can come in and bid. We only allow 30 people in um, and the, everything's spaced right now. Uh, hopefully that'll change. You can leave absentee bids. You also can call in and a representative from our company 
will bid dynamically live for you while you're on the phone. So they'll be in the auction room and you can say, I, yes, I want to bid $100. 110, 120. So they're, so they're telling you what's going on in the auction room and you will be able to bid live with them. And then of course you can also bid dynamically online through live auctioneers or through our platform. And now I've taken up too much time. So I am going to say thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Allison, thank you so much for your presentation. It was wonderful. If you'll un, um, unshare your screen for a moment, yes. we're there gonna we go. take the questions at the end. But first, uh, I hope Kathy Roche, there she is. We're gonna hear oh. now from Kathy Roche who will discuss estate sales for us. And Kathy's also an interior designer. So she's been working with clients for a long time. She's very sensitive to the individual needs during transition times. And she realizes that estate sales are much more than a personal item to many people. So with that, I'm gonna turn it, turn it over to you, Kathy. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So do you see this now? Yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good, all right. So I was really fascinated with Allison's talk because I've actually never talked to a um, but someone at Michon's or Harvey Klar's in, in, um, about the, you know, how they conduct um, liquidating estates and stuff. It was very fascinating. So um, I, and I really saw some areas of overlap um, in what I do and what they do, except for really a different approach. Um, we are a local company. Um, I live in Vallejo. I've been here for 21, 22 years now. And kind of my, just a little about me, my background is, um, in, uh, in I, I got involved, I've always loved auctions. And I remember sitting on the hay bales when I was a kid with my mom and buying stuff from barns in New England. <laughs> That's probably worth a fortune now, but then it was five cents. And uh, so, you know, it just led me to start much later going to auctions, finding cool stuff, starting to sell on eBay. Then someone one day asked, or starting to, I also sold at Michon's at the Alameda sales and um, was asked, hey, can you do an estate sale for me? I said, well, why not? You know, it's, I can figure that out. So um, we started working locally and have, have um, mostly our word of mouth. We're not a large company, but we're very, um, very service oriented to clients. And currently with COVID, we're not, um, we're not conducting sales. It's just too much to manage and too many people. And, um, but to kind of go into what is an estate sale and they can really range like from high end people with auction items that are very high end um, on to just people who want to get rid of their stuff. And um, this is kind of where we fall in. I am not an appraiser. Um, I don't pretend to be, I do know the market. I know how much I can sell things for. I'm, I'm, um, I research and you know look online and see what the comparable things have sold for, but basically we're not we don't say we're appraisals appraisers. Um, so when should you start if you're thinking of doing a sale? When well when you're starting to clean out, um, and what should be sold? That would just be the things that the family you haven't either turned over to an auction house, things family doesn't want. Um, and what is left. And at that point, you could, would call me or someone that does similar services to us after everything is out of the house that isn't going to be taken out. Then we would go and take a look to see if it's worth doing an estate sale. And um, so basically what we really look for is the amount of stuff. It's, uh, it, it's funny, Allison was mentioning brown furniture and people will call me and say, oh, we have all this nice furniture. And I go, good, but what else do you have? <laughs> There's not a large market for, for used furniture, um, recent furniture, although again, mid-century, different certain pieces. I'm also, as an interior designer, I'm trained. I went to Cal Berkeley. I'm also full-time faculty at the Academy of Art in San Francisco. So I'm pretty in tune with homes and decorating, designing, you know, what's, what is being used in the market and what people would be interested in. But what we really look for is the amount of stuff. 
you know, and the condition of it, like how much, how, is there a good accumulation? Because the money for the estate as well as for us in estate sales is in a lot of the little things. You know, people will spend $20 all day long, but not necessarily 300, right? So they'll, a lot of, and they're looking for things, one of three categories. One is things they can resell. We have many dealers that come in, th things that they can use and things that they collect. Those are our three kind of um, groups of people that I've observed through the years. Mm. So again, estate sale, should we do? Should we just do a yard sale, the family, or should we call Michonne's and see, well, what, is it worth it for them to come in and, and do their services? Um, so, and then the last question, would, you, would an estate sale company be even interested? And again, depends on how much stuff. I've seen very neat houses with nice furniture with nothing else. And I go, we're really not interested um, because it's work and it, there's, those things do not necessarily sell. Um, and as I mentioned, I don't do appraisals, but again, am attuned with our market. I know what things sell for, generally what people will pay and price accordingly. So how, we, how um, estate sale companies in general charge sometimes a flat fee some of our local companies I've, I'm familiar with, um, just we're going to charge you X amount of dollars or commission, which is what we do, a sliding scale, similar to, again to um, what Allison mentioned, and extra services. So in our case, extra services are where we wind up cleaning out a hoard, <laughs> you know, a lot of trash, um, you know, extra cleaning, like things that have been sitting in cabinets for 50 years and are full of smoke. And um, so those things we actually have an hourly fee for if we have to bring cleaning. And there's also a fee for extra removal of, of stuff. We have a, we work with a local company for cleaning out, for loading the trucks and getting things out of here. Um, there are some sales I've actually said no to just because it was too much just too much too much work and it would um, be really just i call in the cert the hauling company and say you guys go first and let's see what's left so um a notice to always have a contract uh, we have one there are company it's not difficult to do estate sales and say that you do them um, but always have a contract we have a pretty good one it's it's one i developed through the years just on based on experience um but it, you know, it just basically says what we'll do, what the obligations of the parties are, how um, commission works, how you get paid, etc. Sales taxes. We do charge sales taxes on the items we sell because technically um, the items are consigned to us. And so the state views that as a taxable sale. Um, insurance. Another thing to consider is the estate sale company insured. Um, because you're going to have people coming onto the property. And um, even though you may have homeowner's insurance, um, the, you may not have insurance if, if someone breaks their ankle, say, they trip on the stairs. And the reason for that is because someone else is conducting business in, on your property. So they may say, no, that's the responsibility of the person who was conducting business. So we are, we are also insured. So do check for insurance. Um, just saying the home is insured may or may not be enough. Be aware of that. And obviously right now, COVID restrictions. There are some people doing sales in Solano because we can, where we, they can allow like 10 people at a time and everything's got to be, there are just different restrictions. I decided, no, I don't want to go there right now because it's a lot to manage. But once the restric restrictions are lifted, and we all get our shots, hopefully soon, uh, we can start, um, start going into business again. So important that sales, um, your people have access to the property. And again, make sure you're dealing with someone you trust. I think there is trust in this business. It's like you're consigning your things um, and you're going to have people you don't know possibly on the property. So be aware of who you're dealing with. References are important. Payment and paperwork. Um, I can't speak for other people, but I, I strive to get the money to people like the day after the sale. I don't hold on to it. Um, once we 
we do our agreement. It's like I get a certified check and I send it off along with the record of the sale. We don't itemize every single item. It's a little difficult to do when you're dealing with a lot of things that aren't necessarily of high value, but we do categorize. We'll say, okay, furniture, kitchen, you know, just, and we try as much as possible to break, to give some breakdown of the items sold. In some cases, we will itemize, say, anything over $100 or something, if the client wants us to do that. Um, so what we do, we set up the sale, which means organizing the house, um, getting, bringing in tables, displaying, staging everything, uh, pricing them. And so this is a big one. What's my stuff worth? You know, people will think, well, this was, this was grandmother's China and it's, it's worth so much. And I saw it on eBay for $30 a plate. So that means that this, <laughs> this set is worth $5,000. Well, not necessarily. Um, so it's like um, people will have emotional attachment to items very often feel they're worth more than they are and really need to trust us to, you know, to price them at a price that will sell. And my guess is that China at the end of the, at the end of the sale will still be sitting there because it's not a hot item, <laughs> you know, or someone comes in $50, the whole set, it's gone, you know? So that is, um, that is just something to really, we really discuss that with our clients. So they don't have expectations. Um, but in the long run, with the things that they go, no one would want this, no one would want that, those things do sell and it all averages out to hopefully a successful sale. Um, sometimes we do pre-sell items. Um, my husband sells on eBay. I do, I used to a lot, I don't as much anymore. But if we see something that we think we could get $500 for an eBay and in the sale, it may be 50, we will pull it from the sale and sell it and, and do our commission on it. So um, we establish sale days, what they would be, would they be Thursday and Friday and Saturday or just one day depending on the sale itself. And then I have what I call the end of sale sale, which is <laughs> once we've had the sale for two days, like the third day we'll do a liquidation where it's pretty much any offer that's reasonable will we'll, um, sell the items. And then clean out options again. Um, you know, sometimes clients just want us to close the door and leave. Other times um, they want, they contract with us to do the clean out, the actual final clean out. And we have a local company that does that. So another important, um, Allison went over this for Michonne's, we have a very, um, we're very involved in our mailing and our, our, our marketing for the sales and what do we do? And again, what do other companies do too? This is not just us, but there are some um, good sites for estate sales. One is estatesale.com, one is estatesales.net, which you can certainly look at and see um, I'm on there from some of my older sales. We haven't had one for a while, but they're on there. So you can certainly view that, those. Uh, mailing list, I, companies, I don't know that other companies do this as much, but we have an email list of about 750 local people that, we, that we've, we've gotten at sales. That's where we get the names. <laughs> so, um, so basically we then we've accumulated this over time and that's, I send them an announcement of the sale, link it to the on-site, the online ad for estate sales. And um, so that's another group that sees them. And then also social media, Facebook, we have this Facebook page, flyers. Sometimes we'll put flyers in local antique stores if it, if it seems worth it for the sale. And then obviously the day of sale signs, which my husband loyally puts up <laughs> in the morning at six o'clock. He goes out there and he complains every time, but then he's happy when it's all done. So, um, so those are the day of sale signs. So that's basically the, the process. So it's just really deciding you want to do it, you know, how, um, and then working out the details, the legal and, and, you know, contract details, we set it up, we conduct it, and then we, we conclude it in the way you'd like us to. The, um, so those are the basic things. One of the, the key things too, I do wanna point out is that we do not start doing a sale until everything's out of the house that the family wants and nobody's living there. 
So, and the reason for that is it's really hard to do the work with family coming and going. And then all of a sudden uncle Steve decides he wants something and someone else decides they want something. And pretty soon your work is going out the door. So, um, we we will charge if if that gets to the point where it's affecting the sale we'll actually charge for those items um that people have taken after we price them we've had people come in and say oh i didn't realize that that vase was worth a hundred dollars i think i'll take that right so um we've already done the research we've done all the work so one of our one of our parts of our agreement is that no there's nothing that goes out of the house after the concept contract is signed. So that's basically our, our um, company, generally what um, estate sale companies do. And we're local, um, we're licensed, we're insured. And our we have local clients references available. And obviously we're on hold right now, but hopefully in the summer, we'll be able to have a few sales. I've had to unfortunately turn down a number of them throughout this. So I'm open for questions and um, thank you for your time. Kathy, thank you so much. Yeah. If you can unshare your screen, that way yeah. we can all see each other again. And then everybody can take a moment to unmute themselves. We're gonna to try to do this in a hopefully logical manner. I think I can see you all on my screen. So if you have a question of either Allison or Kathy, uh, mm -hmm. just go ahead and raise your hand. I think it's fascinating to see the differences between the two things. And so there may be many questions here. So we'll, we'll leave the next time for questions. Just raise your hand and I'll try to find you. Anyone, anyone? Not seeing anyone with a question just yet. I, I see Marty has her oh, hand. Oh, Marty, up. Marty, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question for Allison. If if somebody comes, if you've got the 20 items and you have an appraiser come, how do they, and you don't have a bag that, sitting over here that goes to the Goodwill, um, how do they find something that you have no clue about? Well, they can walk through your home and, and they will, they're very good. We have the generalists that do this for us. We have three of them. Um, and they walk through and you can just show them the room and say, you know, I'm in anything in here, do you see of interest? And they'll be able to, to pick and talk about certain things. So yeah. the, you don't, you don't have to necessarily have a bag going to the Goodwill. <laughs> can I add one thing to that, Allison and, and Marty? That one thing that I notice is that people will, I'll go to, to talk to them. They say, oh, we already threw out a lot of stuff. And I go, why did you do that? <laughs> so, you know, if you're contemplating a sale, either however way you want to do it, don't. I mean, obviously, if it's an old tin can, you can throw that away unless it's got advertising on it. <laughs> but, um, but really do not throw anything away that's, that, you know, it really does other than, you know, an old milk bottle, not milk bottle, but maybe trash and paper and stuff like that. But um, it really does. I, I once, just a short story, had a friend we were doing a sale for and she had this bag of stuff. She says, do you want it? Here, take it. And so I took it and there was a bear in there and it was a Stife bear from the early 1900s and it sold for $12,000 on eBay. So this was years ago, but they were just thrown away. This is old stuff. And it was old stuff, stuff, mostly stinky and not worth anything. But this one bear, I pulled it out and I said to my husband, I think this is worth something. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a story. I mean, that doesn't happen every day, but I'm sure Allison, they've seen it also. We just, oh, these are old stinky things. We're just throwing them okay. away. So. Okay, uh, Alice Bluechop, just unmute yourself, please. John. Okay, uh, I guess this question for Allison. Are certain, <clears throat> like furnitures re sell better regionally? You know, like um, I have some primitive furniture. I'm not so sure will sell here. Would it sell better on the East Coast? I mean, I'm just curious about that. I know. Uh, it goes back again to the internet and leveling the playing field. We now have 
it, 10 years ago, you would be correct. You would, we would probably tell you that those, you should find an East Coast auction house. And we have partners that we trade with sometimes, but now with the internet, the way it is, everybody on the East Coast watches what we're selling and they'll find it. It's um, my, my old boss at Butterfield said, if you put a Tiffany lamp in the middle of a field, people will show up to bid on it. And that's what the, that is. And, and we have um, the, the logistics of, of shipping furniture back and forth. Uh, people do it all the time. And um, there, there are really no hurdles for East Coast, mm -hmm. West Coast, West Coast, Europe, um, it just, it, the possibilities are all there. Okay, thank you. Of course. I think Susan Laughlin has a question. Yeah, hi. I have a set of silver from my mother, uh, a pattern that I don't think anyone would want. Uh, what's, what's the best way of s selling silver? Well, from, from our perspective, um, bring it in. Um, we have the, the basic line is that there are going to be dealers that will buy it for, for melt value. Mm -hmm. And, um, right now at silver's at 25, $26. So it, it's a fairly good value just at melt. Um, and especially with a pattern that, that uh, it, and it may be a rare pattern that somebody may see on our site and go for it, uh, you know, um, but that's really what, what the bottom, where we look, our base is melt value. Mm -hmm. And then it goes up from there in aesthetics and, and brand name and things like that. So, um, but I would definitely have it, um, I wouldn't just take it down to the local <laughs> melts. You're, you're not going to, you might as well advertise it either in an estate sale or on, on, in an auction house, because um, there will be people that will definitely buy it. And the, the dealers will get the base amount and they, they, somebody's going to go up one increment. And that's, that's, that's what makes an auction is you have two people <laughs> and hopefully more that want the same item. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I don't want to put you on the spot, Allison, but um, would you know a base value for a 12 piece, piece place setting of sterling silver? It just depends. It, it depends upon the weight of it. Uh, and that's, um, I, that's where uh, the, the appraiser coming out to look at it is really the important part because it's jewelry, silver, those things are, they have to be weighed. They have to be looked at. Um, it's, it, you know, you, you send a, a picture of a plate and we can give you the pattern and we know what it's gonna sell for. And like Kathy says, most China sets uh, you think are gonna be worth a ton of money and we sell them you know, down at the annex for $20. But we do have, you know, if it's Floridanica, then it's gonna go for $1,000 a plate. Right. Um, but the silver is something that you do have to weigh to know what it's worth. Anyone else with a question? Linda has her hand up, but she's muted. Linda, unmute. Okay, my question is, um, my mother saved everything and then I inherited all the things that she saved. So I'm a museum over here. Um, and I've been trying to uh, clean it out, at least sort it, even not throw it away. One of her collections is all these old wristwatches. Um, I mean, I don't know what they are, you know, what they're made of, but is there a value in a bunch of old wristwatches? I mean, I, I suppose there's some ore in there somewhere. Also, uh, yeah, there can be. I, it's funny, there was uh, just a little side, there was a guy here in our local area that was the wristwatch guy, unfortunately passed away. He would buy any, any old watches. The watches that may have value are the ones before digital. Um, that's my experience. They're and, all before. 
Yeah, so, and you know, it's it it is some of them have. Um, I usually will do like a spot check on eBay online or what's it worth dot com or whatever, just to get a feel for that maker, uh, whatever, and then price accordingly. I think, or they may go in a lot. I would assume in, at an auction house they'd probably go in into a lot unless something was pulled out of value. So, Allison, does that pretty much cover it for you? I, I would say uh, yes in, in a nutshell, but yeah. we just had an a annex auction these last three days and we handled an estate with a ton of wristwatches and pocket watches. And there is a big market yeah. for people yeah. who buy them. Yeah. And you also want to check to see, um, we had one down here that was broken and did not work, but it was 18 karat gold. And right, so right. It, it sold for a thousand dollars and, and that, and unfortunately it's going to go to melt, but it, they, they look and they check all of those things. And yeah. so I, I would not discount that collection at all. Yeah. I think it really is worth taking a good look at it because that's what we would do is go through each one and look at it, gold content, platinum, different metal, you know, precious metals. So they make it a lot more valuable. Okay. The, yeah, I was just going to say the quality of a lot of that old stuff is so good. They use such good materials that um, very often the, even the parts can be worth something. People who repair old watches and make them, you know, make them new again. So I, I had you're not getting rid of that one. <laughs> <laughs> be careful what you throw away. <laughs> Linda, there's Sharon. Sharon. Uh, I actually have two questions, one for Allison and then one for Kathleen. Allison, for you, we have a couple of Asian prints that are on silk. We have no idea how old they are, whether they have any value. Are we better off photographing them and sending that info to you or incorporating them in a personal visit around some other items that we want you to take a look at? I would incorporate them with the other items and bring them in. Photo appraisals are, are, are always a good first step, but it is important to touch and feel things. Yeah. And so I would definitely incorporate them and bring them all in at the same time. We can schedule two or three different appraisers to look at the different um, genres that you have at the same time. So you don't have to come in separate times or wait a long time for that. Okay, thank you. Of course. Do we have to bring them in or do you come to us? Well, if we, if you have more than 20 items, we're going to come to you. But if you have less than 20 items, and even with COVID, we have people come in, we schedule it. So they're the only people in the building. We all wear masks and gloves and we're very careful with our COVID um, restrictions because obviously we don't want to get anybody sick and we don't want to get shut down. So um, so we schedule individual appointments. And so we still have people come in and do that. So it, that, that's, the, that's the kind of the marker is 20 items will come to you, less than 20 items, you come to us. And I also wanted to know, um, I have some things that are, uh, that say occupied Japan on the bat on them. So they are from that period. Does that have a, an increased value because of that? I always thought it did because I like history, but I don't know. It again, depends upon the piece. There are certain things that are, are that, that adds um, some authentication to it and some value uh, other times because it gives it a certain date. Um, but other times it, it doesn't add a whole lot. It, it does just depend upon the piece. Sharon, I believe you had an additional question for Kathy. I did, thank you. For um, Kathy or Kathleen, not sure which. Um, I respond to both. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you suggest for people that haven't yet inherited an entire household of a relative, but are in a phase of wind down personally? Yeah, we've done sales like that. Um, it is, well, first of all, we would consult first. Mm -hmm. What do they have? 
Um, it's always, you know, what do, what's the goal? It's, it's it sort of runs a little bit more into the organization um, the kind of hat that I wear sometimes with clients is like how to get them to downsize and um, what they want to do, what's their goal. And then the clean out starts. And um, as far as putting aside what they want to keep and, and another pile, what, what would go in a sale? And the question is always, is there enough to do a sale? Or should just the family come on weekends? And we've even done yard sales for people, you know? It's like, if there's enough for a yard sale, but not really worth it to set up a whole sale. So we've assisted and also people moving. You know, we, we did one last year where the people were moving, they had tons of stuff. And they, I said, okay, move, take everything you want and then we'll, we'll handle the rest. And so that would, I hope that answers your question, but we're personalized. So it depends on the goal. And, um, you know, if, if it's something I can do personally or one of my um, people that helped me, um, we would certainly look at that. Great, thanks a lot. Susan. Um, so first of all, I wanna thank you both. I, I uh, really have learned a lot today and I appreciate you taking the time to meet with us. Um, my question is, I, I, you mentioned a couple of places because I'm always thinking, well, is it worth anything, right? And so I was wondering about resources and you mentioned one uh, was whatitsworth.com and then not, obviously yeah. eBay. eBay, you, obviously. Any pointers about using those kinds of sites and how to make sure, you know, you're looking at things correctly? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's what's it worth. I think I haven't used that one. I use mostly eBay. Um, and always, if you're searching on eBay, search at sold for sold items, not what people are listing them for. Because this is very often people say, oh, I saw this on eBay for $1,000. And I go, yeah, it's been languishing there for three years, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, look for sold items, sold items similar. And I do think research is sometimes a bit of an art because you don't always know what it is. I've had people show me stuff, what's this? I go, I don't know, let me figure it out. And then I go on and I have different keywords, different ways you can search and find it. Um, so, but definitely sold items. What did it actually sell for? And, and again, on auction sites, I think if I'm right, Allison, it'll say what things sold for. Does it not? Yes. So I've, I've been on live auctioneers and gone to some of the auctions and then it'll say what it sold for. So you can do a general Google search sometimes and find the items in other places other than eBay. eBay is odd because it's, you know, in my, this is my opinion, it sort of had its, its big day. And now it's just kind of a lot of stuff. There's still some good buys and good, good data there, but not as much as there was in the past. And plus the market has overall depressed a bit, or quite a bit. So um, my husband sells on eBay full time. He's an expert in, in vintage electronics. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. And so I get a I get a rundown every day. <laughs> 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 but anyway, so I hope that helps. And again, I think the site is something like what's it worth dot com or but I, you may have to pay for that. So I, that, I, that's what I was. Yeah, I avoid that. when I have to pay. I try to find things with, you know, so you're not like you have. 15 ten dollars coming out of your account every month you know so um anyway so that's basically my advice i don't else do you have any additions on how you research that well i most definitely prices realized on auction yeah. sites and yeah. um heritage is a huge auction mm -hmm. house out of texas and they handle a, a plethora of things and so that's a very good source of um, everything from designer bags to memorabilia to they, they started as a stamp and coin auction house and they just have uh, there, there's not a department that they don't have um, so that would that's a good place and live auctioneers is a great place that right. you have to sign up but it's free um, most other um, art sites you're, you are gonna have to pay for, like Kathy said. So yeah. um, th those are the best. And by all means, Kathy's first comment is of most important. It has to be sold. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wonderful. Uh, do I see any more questions? I have. Um, yes, Alice. Uh, I, I, one of the things that we were, I was concerned about if we, let's say this year had the household appraised, you know, just in general, like it would be a big, big, you know, job, but, um, and then let's say we're gone in five, six years, let's just say, uh, would the discrepancy between the appraisal now and five years cause, you know, let's say five or six years from now, would that cause a problem with, I mean, do you have a problem between the, the what things are worth now and what they might be worth after we're gone, you know, if you have that done? Does that make sense? Did I make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That makes total sense. Um, for the most part, the 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 market trends are not going to swing that much for five years, except as I say, for gold and silver values. Um, that that's always when when we we actually are redoing. We had to do a date of a death appraisal five years ago when the husband passed, and now the wife has passed. So we're going back with the exact same appraisal. And we really feel as though the only uh, things that are, the, the estimates are gonna change are going to be the gold and the silver. Okay, thank um, you. Randomly, you may get an artist that's really hot all of a sudden, and that may bring up the price of, of some fine art. But uh, overall, five years is not going to, make that much of a difference in your estimates. Kathy, would you agree? Yeah, I would. Um, again, I, I am not an appraiser, although similar to what Alice, Allison said, I can I price stuff if it is a silver piece with against the spot price, like what's the price today? Like we'll now and then have a piece of sterling hollow wear or something that pops up in, in and so I just say, well, what's the price? Same with eBay, we price it the same way. Um, so. It, yeah, and it's going to change though, but we're not, as again, not certified appraisers, so I don't get into that too much. So, okay, thank you both. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, this has just been so informative and so delightful. If I could ask each of you just to repeat the contact for yourself and your business, and we'll begin with Allison. If you want to share screen and throw up your, your, Thing again, or you can just tell us, just so everybody gets gets it written down. You can put it in the sure. chat. Oh, you can put it in your chat. That's a good idea. All right, that's everyone. Here we go. Thank you, Kathy, for that suggestion. And for some of you, if you haven't ever done this before, you can copy and paste. <laughs> Goes into chat so that you have it later. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it reminds me of those commercials where they're, they're I, I've forgotten, I think it's insurance where they have, okay, now we're going to practice opening a PDF. It's like the, it's, it's you know, they're, don't become your parents. Is that, have you seen that, yeah, that yeah. A line? It's, they're very funny. Okay, it now we're funny. going to open a PDF. <laughs> it makes me laugh. <laughs> oh, let's see. There we go. Thank you, Allison. Let me put mine's almost there. There you go. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Yep. Linda, Linda, I was going to tell a short little story. I had a stamp collection when I was a kid and decided we were moving and this huge stamp collection consumed a, a pile of my uh, drawers and wanted to get rid of it. So I started looking and realized that all those five cent stamps, sheets and sheets and sheets of them, you can't get five cents for them because you don't have enough saliva to put them all on the envelope. <laughs> and the only thing I could do was the Vallejo uh, Senior Center would take them from me and I was glad to give them all to them. But it was a matter of just lowering your expectations of, of what to do with a stamp collection. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. I yeah, also yeah. Uh, wanted to say that we do tape uh, our speaker series, and they will. This will be posted uh, on our website. So, if there's something that you know, one of the slides showed that you wanted to go back to reference, that you will be able to do that. Usually, takes us, I don't know, 
so give us two weeks, but usually sooner than that, but uh, till it gets posted. Well, thanks again to everybody. Hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Kathy. It was uh, very informative. It was great. Oh, thank you. Thank that you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.